now be allowed to change it. Yeah. Order. The question is that this House has considered money, creation and society. Mr Michael Meacher. Um, I, too, very strongly uh, congratulate the Honourable Member for Wickham uh, on securing this debate, uh, which I think uh, everyone recognises uh, is vitally important and which has not been debated uh, in this House, I believe, uh, for 170 years since the Robert Peel's uh, Bank Charter Act of 1844. And I remember the Honourable Member drawing my attention to that when we were both last speaking in a similar debate. Uh, and that uh, Act prohibited the private banks from printing uh, paper money. And in the light of the uh, financial crash of 2008-9 and the colossal expansion of money supply that underpinned it, uh, no less than an increase of 22-fold in the 30 neoliberal years between 1980 and 2010, I think the issue today is whether that prohibition uh, should be extended now to include electronic money. Uh, it is unfortunate, as um, the Honourable Gentleman referred to, uh, that it is so little understood by the public uh, that money uh, is created uh, every time by the banks that they make loans. Uh, in effect, they have a virtual monopoly, uh, something like 97% uh, over domestic credit creation, and it is the banks, therefore, the banks, which determine how money is allocated across the economy. Uh, and that has led to the vast majority of money being channelled into property markets and into the financial sector. According to Bank of England figures for the decade uh, to 2007, 31% of additional money created by bank lending went towards mortgage lending, 20% towards commercial property and 32% to the financial sector, including mergers and acquisitions and trading and financial markets. Those are really extraordinary figures. Oh, well, you have to get oh, yes, of course. Does he, on the basis of what he's just said, does he not think there's an argument for the Bank of England to intervene in that particular situation where you've got unlimited unlimit credit? From banks. Um, my my honourable friend um, anticipates really the, uh, the main line of my argument, so if you could be patient, I think I will satisfy him uh, very fully. Uh, it means that only, and this is a crucial point, it means that only 8% went to businesses outside the financial sector, with a further 8% uh, funding uh, credit cards and personal loans. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, it's grateful, Honourable Gentleman, for giving way. I hear what he says about um, money going into building and housing and mortgages, but isn't that because the holders of money reckon they can get a decent return in that sector? Now, they would invest elsewhere if they thought they would get a better return. One of the reasons they probably get a better return in the UK, say, unlike Germany, is there are, not, there are no rent controls here. And as a result of the lack of rent controls, money is more likely to go into property rather than to go into developing industry, which I think would be more likely to happen in general. Yes, I, I very much agree with that argument. And again, uh, I can assure him that I'm going to return to this. I think it's better to leave it to that uh, point in my speech. But he's absolutely right. It is, of course, the greater returns that the banks uh, can get uh, from the housing sector, the rental sector. And we have a particular rental sector in this country, different from Germany and other countries, which causes it. But I will come to this. Uh, yet it, it is only this last six, the, the two eight percent, lending to businesses and consumer credit, that has a real impact on GDP and economic growth. Only that 16 percent. The conclusion, I think, is unavoidable. We cannot continue with a system where so little of the money created by banks is used for the purposes of economic growth and value creation, and instead, and I'm picking up the point that the Honourable Gentleman made a moment ago, the overwhelming majority of the money created uh, has the effect of inflating property prices and therefore pushing up the cost of living. Now, in a nutshell, the banks have too much power 
and they have greatly abused it. Firstly, they have been granted enormous privileges since they can create wealth simply by writing an accounting entry on a register and they decide uh, who uses that wealth and for what purpose. And they have used their power of credit creation to hugely favour property and consumption lending over business investment because the returns are higher and more secure and thus the banks maximise their own interest but not the national interest. Secondly, if they fail to meet their liabilities, they are not penalised. Someone else pays up for them. The first £85,000 uh, of deposits are covered by a guarantee underwritten by the state. And in the event of a major financial crash, they are bailed out by the implicit taxpayer guarantee. Uh, just let me finish and I'll, of course, give way. Uh, they've been encouraged by this into much more risky, uh, even reckless investment, uh, especially in the case of exotic financial derivatives. Um, it's beginning to queue up, but just let me finish. Uh, <laughs> and uh, even to the point where after the financial crash of 2008-9, the state was obliged to undertake direct bailout costs of nearly £70 billion, plus provide a further... Uh, near £1 trillion in support for loan guarantees, liquidity schemes and asset protection arrangements. Of course, I give way. I wholly, wholly agree with the, what he's just said. The moral hazard problem here is absolutely enormous and most one, one of the most fundamental problems. I just would share with him that the British Bankers Association picked me up when I said it was a state-funded deposit insurance scheme. They told me it was industry-funded. I think the issue now is that nobody really believes for a moment that this scheme will actually not be backstopped by the taxpayer. Well, I'm, as always, very grateful for the intervention. Uh, I was going to say with my honourable friend, uh, but on this I think he probably is. Now, uh, uh, yes. On the question of banks, and particularly in terms of investing in the property market, does my honourable friend think we can learn anything from the United States with Fannie Mae, the collapse of Fannie Mae, for example? Are we in a similar situation? Well, I do. Um, and again, this, this uh, takes me down a different path, but I, I do actually think there's a very, uh, a very considerable read across. Yes. I'm very grateful to my um, honourable friend for giving way. He's been absolutely magnificent in diagnosing the problem. But when it comes to the solution, when it comes to passing power away from banks, rather than passing power upward to a, to a, to a regulator or to the state, would he entertain the idea of perhaps empowering the, the consumer, the person who deposits money with the bank? Surely the real failure was the failure of the 1844 Bank Charter Act to give legal ownership of deposits to the person paying money into the bank. The, the, the basis of fractional reserve banking is the legal ownership that the bank has when money is paid in. If we tackle that, power will pass from these big state-subsidised corporations called banks outward to the wider economy. Yes, I mean, I have a great deal of sympathy with um, what the Honourable Gentleman is saying. Um, hold on, just, just let me <laughs> one at a time. Uh, I was going to say a little bit more than I just have sympathy. Um, I, 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 I am going to talk at the end. I mean, half of my speech is really going to be about what I think the alternative should be uh, and why I think the capacity to regulate what is an increasingly, exceedingly complex situation in the financial sector is not a proper way, and I'm going to produce my own solution. But I agree that to the degree to which people people can achieve greater control over the money that they themselves have contributed, I would be very strongly in favour of structural changes which bring that about. Diana. I'm grateful to my honourable friend. I was intrigued to hear my honourable friend mention depositor protection. Yeah. Is my honourable friend saying he's against any form of depositor protection? So, sorry, so the depositor protection. The, the protection of deposits is underwritten by, is, is up to £85,000 of those deposits, and it is guaranteed, it is underwritten by the state. So the, the are you against? Oh, no, no, sorry. Uh, no, no, I, I'm not, well, I'm neither for nor against. What I am making, I'm really making the point that this is uh, not something, th this encourages the banks to uh, increase their risk taking because if they are caught out, for each deposit up to £85,000 is guaranteed by the state. 
All I'm saying is we really need, and here I totally agree with my uh, honourable, the honourable member for Wickham, that we need much wider structural change. It's not a question of just tweaking one thing here or there, and I'd like to come on to that. Now, given that, I think it raises the question at the heart of this debate. I mean, who should create the money? Uh, and I just ask this question, would Parliament ever have voted to delegate power to create money to those same banks that caused the horrendous financial crisis from which the world is still suffering? I think the answer to that is unambiguously no. So the question then that needs to be put is, how should we achieve the switch from unbridled consumerism uh, to a framework of productive investment capable of generating a successful and sustainable manufacturing uh, and industrial base which can securely underpin UK living standards. Now the two models uh, which have been hitherto used to operate such a system. One was the centralised direction of finance uh, used, and I have to say extremely successfully, <laughs> Um, by several Asian countries, especially the Southeast Asian uh, so-called tiger economies, um, after the Second World War to achieve takeoff. But I'm not suggesting that that method is appropriate for us today. It's not suited to advanced industrial democracies. The other was to bring about, uh, through official guidance, uh, guidance in inverted commas, the rationing of bank credit in accordance with national targets, which, uh, wh and where necessary, through quantitative um, direct controls. This was a policy which did work well for a quarter of a century in the UK in the post-world period until the 1970s, when it was steadily replaced by the purely market system of competition and credit control, uh, based exclusively on interest rates, uh, which has, in our experience of the last 30, 40 years, proved deeply unstable, dysfunctional and profoundly costly. I'll give one moment. Since then, there have been uh, sporadic attempts uh, to create a safer banking system, but these have been deeply flawed. Either regulation uh, under the dictates of the neoliberal ideology has been ever so light touch, and I have to say by New Labour just as much as by the other government, that it has been entirely ineffective. Uh, all the regulation is so detailed. Uh, Basel III, I would remind the House, has more than 400 pages, uh, and the US Dodd-Frank's bill uh, has a staggering 8,000 pages or more, that it is impossibly bureaucratic, impossibly bureaucratic, and almost certainly full of loopholes. All the regulation was so cautious, like the Vickers Commission uh, proposal of Chinese walls between the investment and retail uh, arms uh, of a bank, that it, in my view, frankly, really missed the main point. Or whatever route was tried, and this is very significant, it faced the regulatory arbitrage uh, at the hands of the phalanx of lawyers and accountants in the city, earning their ill-gotten bonuses by unpicking or circumventing whatever regulatory safeguards the authorities put in place. I give way to my... Yeah, sorry. Uh, I you, Mr. Gilmore. He's always very good on these subjects. Uh, but would I, would I be going too far if I was to suggest that we should nationalise the cities, nationalise the banks, and run up ourselves as a government on behalf of the people? Well, public ownership of the banks is, uh, I think, a, a significant issue. I am not actually going to uh, <coughs> propose that in my speech. I do actually take the view that it would be a mistake to return RBS and Lloyds to the private sector. Uh, and I think the arguments about Barclays and HSBC need to be made, but I think not in this debate. Uh, I am going to suggest an alternative solution which changes the power of the banks in terms of money creation and puts it in different hands to ensure better results in terms of a national interest. Now, against that background, there are solid grounds, I think, for examining, and this is where I do come to my proposal, uh, the creation of a sovereign monetary system, as recommended by several expert commentators recently. Uh, Martin Wolf, uh, who, as everyone uh, in this House will know, is an influential chief economics commentator of the FT, 
uh, wrote an article a few months ago, on the 24th of April to be precise, entitled Strip Private Banks of Their Power to Create Money. This is from Martin Wolf, recommending switching from bank-created debt to a nationalised money supply. Also, Lord Adair Turner, who was a former chair of the Financial Services Authority, uh, delivered a speech um, about 18 months ago in February 2013 discussing an alternative uh, to quantitative easing, uh, which he turned overt money finance, uh, which is also known as a form of sovereign money. Now, such a system and here I will describe its main outline. Such a system would restrict the power to create all money to the state via the central bank. Changes to the rules governing how banks operate would still permit them to make loans, but would make it impossible for them to create new money in the process. The central bank would continue to follow the remit uh, set by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, which is currently to deliver price stability, which is defined at the present time uh, as inflation target of 2%. The central bank would be exclusively responsible for creating as much new money as was necessary to support non-inflationary growth. Decisions on money creation will be taken independently of government, uh, by a newly formed uh, Monetary Creation Committee or by the existing uh, Monetary Policy Committee, either of which would be accountable uh, to the Treasury Select Committee. And I think that uh, accountability to the House is crucial to this whole process. Yes, I give way to my little friend again. Would, um, coming back to the, the original question I asked them earlier on, what role would the Bank of England have in this? Oh, the, the bank, um, I, I'm coming on to explain, the Bank of England has an absolutely crucial role. If he listens to the, in fact, the last bit of my speech, he will get a full answer for that question. A sovereign money system thus offers, if I may say this, a clear thermostat to balance the economy, which is notoriously lacking at present. In times when the economy uh, is in recession uh, or growth is slow, uh, the Money Creation Committee will be able to increase the rate of money creation uh, to boost aggregate demand. If growth is very high and inflationary pressures are increasing, uh, they, can slow it, they can slow down the rate of money creation. Now that is a, a, a crucial improvement over the present system whereby the banks will either produce too much mortgage credit in a boom because of the high profit prospects, which produces a housing bubble and raises house prices, or they produce too little credit in a recession, which exacerbates the lack of demand. Now, as to lending to businesses, which I think is uh, central to this whole debate... And, uh, uh, yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, I just want to take you back just a, a few moments, because you mentioned about accountability to Parliament, and I think he said the select committee. I just, wonder whether we, yeah, I just wonder whether we would I just really just enlarge that a little bit and say when he says accountable, what powers would Parliament have to ensure that this was followed through in a proper way and with the rules that, that's been, been laid down? Uh, the purpose of uh, accountability uh, to the Treasury Select Committee uh, is to uh, enable Parliament fully to explore the manner in which the uh, Money Creation Committee is, or the Monetary <coughs> Policy Committee is working. And I would anticipate a full three hours uh, discussion uh, with uh, the leading officials of those committees before the Trophy Select Committee, uh, and if necessary, they could be given a hard time. Certainly, uh, these persons who I would see as the most competent uh, persons in this House to deal with the matter, uh, would make clear what their priorities were, would make clear where they thought the Money Creation Committee was not giving uh, sufficient attention to the way in which it uh, was operating, and would suggest changes. They wouldn't have the power formally to compel the Money Creation Committee to change, but I think the whole point about uh, select committees, which are televised and discussed within the media, uh, would have a very big effect. But it's a, it's a major change compared to what we have at the present time. It, like all systems, if it is inadequate, uh, it can be modified, changed, uh, and increasingly enforced. Now, as to lending to businesses, which, as I say, I think is... is uh, yes, of course. 
Um, with respect to the question of the Treasury Select Committee, does he see a potential role perhaps for some form of joint committee, perhaps with the Public Accounts Committee, insofar as that or the origins of that are to do with taxation and spending? And would he think that perhaps broadening it a bit in that direction might be helpful so that we got the full benefit of the all-party agreement um, of both committees? Uh, well, I think, I, I think it's a helpful intervention. Um, I wasn't attempting, uh, partly because it's a relatively, well, I don't think it is relatively small, it's a relatively big part of what I'm proposing, but it's not for me to suggest exactly what the structure of accountability should be, and I would be strongly in favour of increasing it in the way the Honourable Gentleman has said. Uh, I think until this House is content that it has uh, a proper channel of accountability which is effective in terms of the way our financial system is run. Uh, until that uh, is reached, I think we should uh, bring in further changes uh, to the structure of accountability as may be necessary, such as along the lines he suggested. Now, if I could really get on to this question of uh, lending to businesses, which uh, after the experience we've had uh, in the last decade or more, last half decade, has been very, very unsatisfactory. The central bank under a sovereign monetary system would be empowered to create money for the express purpose of that funding role. The money would be lent to banks with the requirement that the funds are used for productive purposes. Whilst lending for speculative purposes, for example to purchase pre-existing assets, either financial or property, would not be allowed. The central bank could also create and lend funds to other intermediaries, and the Honourable Gentleman for uh, Wickham referred to this, such as regional or publicly owned business banks, which would ensure that a floor, a floor could be placed. Uh, under the level of uh, lending to businesses, which would be a great relief, I think, to British business today, guaranteeing support for the real economy. And I should add that within the limits imposed, and this is, again, uh, I say this to avoid misunderstanding, uh, within the limits imposed by the central bank on the broad purposes for which money may be lent, lending decisions would be entirely at the discretion of the lending institutions, not of the government or the central bank. Now, I conclude that I believe a sovereign monetary system offers a very considerable advantage over the present system. Uh, it would create a better and safer banking system because banks would have an incentive to take lower levels of risk since there would be no option of a bailout or rescue from taxpayers and thus moral hazard uh, would be reduced. Second, it would increase economic stability uh, because money creation by banks tends to be pro-cyclical, uh, as I've explained, whereas money creation by the central bank would be counter-cyclical. Thirdly, sovereign money crucially supports the real economy when under the current system, 83% of lending does not, at the moment, go into productive investment. I underline that three times. Fourth. Would my honourable friend give way? Yes, of course. Uh, uh, my honourable friend has said that uh, the aim of this would be to um, reduce risk and for uh, banks to be more cautious. But on the other hand, if we are to encourage innovation in manufacturing, it does not mean that we would require to have an investment bank at state level so we could actually fund the more riskier um, levels of innovation to ensure that they actually could get to market because they're not at the point where they would be commercially viable. Uh, that's an extremely important point and again I strongly support that. Uh, we do need, and I think it's fair to say that the current Secretary of State uh, for BIS has been struggling to introduce a, uh, a a government uh, supported business investment bank uh, and has recently announced something along those lines. I think that should be greatly expanded. Uh, the book, which I hope most of us have read by Mariana Mazzucato, uh, shows the degree, uh, which I think is the return of the entrepreneurial state, the degree to which funding uh, for major innovation, not just in this country, uh, but in many other countries which she cites, uh, has been financed uh, through the state, because the private sector was not willing to take on board the degree of risk involved. Uh, one understands that, but one does 
does need to recognise the role of a state is extremely important, and I would like to see, under a Labour government, something like this being uh, uh, brought in. I'm very grateful to my honourable friend. He's making a, a tremendous case for, for money creation and, and, and what we should be looking at in this House. But I, I wonder if there's also a cultural issue here. Many businesses uh, and many lenders say to me when I speak to them that there's a cultural problem in the United Kingdom for businesses, and particularly entrepreneurial businesses that we've heard about from honourable friend uh, in Glasgow, to uh, giving away equity rather than debt, so funding businesses through equity rather than debt, and other countries across Europe who are incredibly successful at giving away equity rather than debt have yeah. much more growth in their entrepreneurial economy. Yeah. Well, again, I think that's uh, perfectly true, a very important point, and actually I think the proposals I'm making were, would support that. Uh, there is a very different uh, climate in this country, largely brought about uh, by the, uh, the, the, the churning that goes on uh, in the City of London, where profits have to be uh, increased or, or reach a relevant size within a very short period, like three or six months. And most uh, entrepreneurial businesses cannot possibly produce a, a decent profit within that period of time. So the current financial system does not encourage uh, what my honourable friend is wanting, and I think uh, these proposals uh, would make uh, money creation available to the people we really want to support much more fully than at present. Um, the fourth point, and I've only got five in case members are wearying, uh, the fourth point under the current system, house price bubbles transfer wealth, as we all know from the uh, young to the old and from those who can't get on the property ladder uh, to existing house owners, which increases wealth inequality, whilst removing the ability of banks to create money should dampen house price rises and thus reduce the rate of wealth inequality. My fifth and, and last point, which I think is a very important one, sovereign money redresses a major democratic deficit. Under the present system, around just 80 board members across the largest five banks uh, make decisions that shape the entire UK economy, even though these individuals have no obligation or mandate to consider the needs of society or the economy as a whole and are not accountable in any way to the public. It is for the maximisation of their own interests and not to those of the national interest. Now, under, a sovereign, uh, under sovereign money, the Money Creation Committee would be highly transparent, we've discussed this already, and accountable uh, to Parliament. So for all of these reasons, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I believe that the examination of the merits uh, a sovereign, of a sovereign monetary system is now urgently needed, and I would call on the government to set up a commission on money and credit with particular reference to the potential benefits of sovereign money, which offers a way out of the continuing and worsening financial crises that have blighted this country and indeed the whole international economy for decades. Peter Lilly. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, thank you. It's a pleasure.